Hello, my name is Arielle Ford, and for more than two decades, I've been dedicated to helping people find love, keep love, and be love. I've written many books on the topic, including my international bestseller, The Soulmate Secret, Manifesting the Love of Your Life with the Law of Attraction. And this book is now in 21 languages in 40 countries around the world. I've actually helped tens of thousands of men and women of all ages and all sizes and all income levels find true love. And this includes my 80-year-old widowed mother-in-law and a 93-year-old man in Dublin. I've also written Turn Your Mate Into a Soulmate, a practical guide to happily ever after. It's a book I wish I'd read before my wedding. You see, I was a first-time bride at the age of 44. And as an older newlywed, I had a shocking discovery early on in my marriage when it became apparent that while I'd manifested the love of my life, I had zero ability to be a good partner. In fact, the one thing I was the best at was being the boss, which I can tell you is a total detriment to a happy marriage. It was at that moment I decided to become a student of love to uncover everything I could find on what it takes to have a long, happy, satisfying marriage. And as part of my process, I actually did 200 hours of interviews with the world's leading love, marriage, and relationship experts. This is people like Dr. John Gray, who wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and Dr. John Gottman, who is really considered the world's leading marriage researcher. He can observe a couple for 15 minutes and tell you with 90% accuracy if they'll still be married in three years. And I also interviewed Dr. Harville Hendricks, who Oprah calls the marriage whisperer, as well as tons of other experts on mating and dating and where and how to find love. And with every interview I did, I road tested what I learned on my own marriage and I found dozens of tips and techniques and tools for making love work. And today I'm gonna to share with you the best of the best of what I found so that you too can have the relationship you've always dreamed of. And for those of you that are single, later on in this program, I'm gonna give you everything you need to find the love of your life during these difficult pandemic days. And while it may seem like it's harder than ever to find love, the truth is, once you know how to do it, it's almost easier than the pre-pandemic times. But first, it's really essential that before you select a mate, you understand how to make choices for your life partner with whom you can find long-term happiness. Makes sense, right? So let's talk about love. It's right up there with air, food, and water as one of the most vital ingredients for existence. Love nourishes our souls. It arouses our deepest desires. And yet for many people, it's the hardest thing to find. And even harder still is sustaining that love once you've found it. So have you ever wondered, why do we humans seek a soulmate, a life partner, a beloved? I mean, really, what is it about us that craves this deep connection to another? Are we genetically made up to be mated? Well, I have a fascinating and possible answer for you. And it comes from Aristophanes. He was an acclaimed comic, playwright, and philosopher in ancient Athens. And he offers this wild tale that he shared at Plato's Symposium about how this deep desire for connection to another came about. So here's the story. Long, long ago in primal times, people had two bodies, four arms, four legs, two heads, and they were big and round. They were these roly-poly creatures who real, like wheeled around the earth like clowns doing cartwheels and they were super powerful. And there were three sexes. And there were three sexes, the all male, the all female, and the androgynous, who were half male and half female. Now, the males were said to have descended from the sun, the females from the earth, and the androgynous couples from the moon. 
And these creatures tried to scale the heights of heaven, and they planned to set upon the gods. And while Zeus was up there, he thought about blasting them to death with thunderbolts, but he didn't want to deprive himself of their devotions and offerings. So instead, he decided to cripple them by chopping them in half with his sword, in effect, separating the two bodies. And then he scattered the two halves of each of them in opposite directions, right? Just split them apart. And Aristophanes claimed that when two people who were torn apart and they find each other again, they never again want to be separated from their soulmate. So when a half finally does meet its other half, they become deliriously happy and overjoyed with the promise of new love and delight. And they believe, at least for a while, that they are now complete, that they're now reunited with their other half, thus obtaining wholeness. So when I first heard this story, and I heard it from the magnificent Jean Houston, it just made so much sense to me. So what we're going to do right now is explore this topic of soulmate love. We're going to find out how to find it and how to keep it. But first, let's start with a definition, because the word soulmate means different things to different people. And I believe that a soulmate is first and foremost somebody you can completely be yourself with, somebody with whom you share unconditional love. And when you look into each other's eyes, you have the experience of being home. And if you accept this definition, let me tell you something really fun. You already have lots of soulmates in your life. It's your kids, your parents, your siblings, your business partners, your best friends, even your cats and dogs fit the definition of soulmate. So for you singles out there who are dreaming of a romantic soulmate, the place to begin today, right now, is to share your appreciation and gratitude and focus your attention on all the love you already have. Because when you begin to focus on all the love you already have, that awareness brings more love to you. It actually makes you romantic to ro It actually makes you a magnet for romantic love. Now, one of the ways you can do this is just create a daily gratitude practice. Just close your eyes, move your attention down to your heart. And while you're focusing on your heart, send out beams of love to all of your soulmates, your family and your friends, the ones that you love, that you love you. The ones that you know love you and the ones that you know you love. Now, you've probably heard the old adage, what you put your attention on grows. And when it comes to love, this is 100% true. So remember, every day, take five minutes, close your eyes, put your attention on your heart, and be grateful and focus on the abundance of love you already have. And remember, while you're doing this, thoughts are things. So when you're focused on the good rather than on what's missing, you get more good. Now, there are a few beliefs and myths out there in the world that get in the way of some people actually manifesting a soulmate. And these are things like, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too damaged, all the good ones are taken, the one that was got away, none of which is true. <laughs> and number two, there's a myth that we each only get one big love in a lifetime. And that is totally not true. In fact, if you're divorced and the person you're divorced from, you once felt like, yes, this was my soulmate. This is my soulmate. Here's something that I know is true. Some soulmate relationships come with an expiration date, and it doesn't mean that they weren't your soulmate. You know, maybe you were just meant to be with them for a certain time to have children with them. But just because you got divorced doesn't mean they weren't your soulmate. A few more myths I want to bust out there is myth number one. If it's meant to be, it will just happen. Ugh, nothing could be further from the truth. 
Success in love is like success in any other area of your life. It takes commitment, intention, investment, work, and getting out of your comfort zone. And myth number two is, and this is a big one, especially for women, when I meet my soulmate, I'll just know it. And I got to tell you, love at first sight is a very, very rare thing. Most people don't know when they meet somebody whether or not this is the one. And about 90% of the women who are happily married said they needed to go on at least five dates with their husband before they really felt a deep chemistry and a, a knowing about them. So don't let that stop you. Just because you meet somebody and you don't feel butterflies in your stomach doesn't mean that they're not the one. Now, one other thing I learned, and I learned this from my grandmother, is that there's no shortage of love in the world. Grandma always used to say, there's a lid for every pot. So just because right now you don't know how or when or where you're going to meet the one, it doesn't mean they're not out there. But here's what it does mean. It means you must become visible in order to meet this person who, by the way, is also looking for you. So before I share with you all the action steps to take and find love, let's take a moment to talk about love. Like what is love really? It's, it's something I could talk about for days, but what, it, what I do know for sure about love is that it's simply one of the most biggest important elements of our lives. And as we learned in the story about the roly polies from Aristophanes, and as we learned from the story about the roly polies and Aristophanes, it's perfectly natural to want have, it's perfectly natural to have love and to want love. And here's what's happening when we are in love. When we're in love, our brain is filled with adrenaline and dopamine and oxytocin and the part of our frontal cortex, the part that has to do with judgment, especially judgment around the object of your affection. Well, that part of your brain actually shuts down. And the scientists have studied this and they can see it on MRIs and brain scans. And while it feels totally great to be in love, I think it's nature's greatest drug high. I have since learned that real, mature, long lasting love is something much deeper, much richer, and so much more meaningful. And I now call the state of being in love, are you ready for this? I call it the socially acceptable form of insanity. So if being in love isn't really love, what is love? And what I've learned is that love is more than just a word, although we certainly need lots of words to describe it. And it's more than just an emotion, but there are lots of times when we can feel it. But I believe that first and foremost, love is a behavior. Love is a choice. Love is a feeling. It's the juiciest part of life. Love opens our hearts, it expands our worlds, it makes us smile. And for love, we make commitments and agreements to share our life with another in good times and in bad. You know that one, right? When we pledge our love to another, we say to them, I'm gonna love you on your good days and your bad days. I'm gonna be your safe place to land. I'm gonna share with you my attention, affection and appreciation. And with you, I become a better woman. And with me, you'll become a better man. And I will be your best friend, your lover, your partner, your protector. And if things don't work out, I'm not gonna sell you out. And love, it's about giving and it's about receiving. And it's about being willing to forgive. So I, I actually think that in the end, love is an art and we are the artists and how and where and when we express and share and shower their loved ones with love, this will be our masterpiece. So love is much more than a feeling. And for those of you that are married or have been married, I know that you know there are days 
that you could really hate your partner. But this doesn't mean that you don't love them. Okay, it doesn't mean that you don't love them, but you're not loving their behavior. So to maintain lasting love, the behavior needs to be loving. And a long lasting marriage requires a combination of kindness, devotion, trust, friendship, and clear communication. And one of the most important things we humans need is to feel emotionally and physically safe together safe in order to thrive. So in a little bit, I'm going to share with you everything you need to know how to find the love of your life online. But before we do that, it's important to have a really good understanding of everything that it takes to be successful at love. So first, I'm going to depress you. Okay, here are the sad statistics about marriage today. Now, most of you probably already know that 50% of first marriages end in divorce, and most of those marriages last maybe eight years. But even sadder still, did you know that 61% of second marriages and 74% of third marriages also end in divorce? I, I mean, who knew? So with these kinds of statistics, it really makes sense to find ways to understand what it takes to make a marriage work and how to select a partner, not solely based on how you feel about them, but also, and maybe more importantly, their capacity to be a good partner for you. So for the best chance at finding real, mature, adult love, we need to have a little bit of self-reflection. We need to dig deep and really uncover what are the traits and qualities and values you most need in a partner. So getting clear, laser clear about who this person is, is critical, what they're like, what their values are. And then secondly, how do you most want to feel when you're with them? I mean, it's essential to really dive into how do I want, you know, how do I want to feel when I'm with my soulmate? You know, so what does this take? This takes lots of dating. All right. So a lot of people, especially if they're over 40, they just want to rush in and find somebody instantly. But the experts pretty much agree. It takes a full year to get to know somebody. That's 12 months, four seasons, 365 days and nights. So I'm going to really urge you don't rush in to one of the most important choices you're ever going to make. So what are the elements that make up a good or great marriage? First, as I just said, safety. We need to feel that we're loved and secure with our mates and that our physical and emotional well-being is a priority for them. And then we need a great mix of chemistry, connection, empathy, compatibility, communication, commitment, and here's the single most important thing, a shared vision for the future. And a shared vision for the future includes essentials like, where are we going to live? Will we raise children together? How do we spend our spare time? Where do we vacation? And something you may not have ever thought of, do we have a shared purpose? Is there something bigger than either of us? My husband, Brian, came up with a really cool way to describe it. He calls it soulmate math because in basic arithmetic, one plus one equals two. But in soulmate math, one plus one equals 11 and your love blesses the world. So finding a shared purpose as your joint gift to the world adds new and deeper dimensions to the relationship. I mean, one couple that I think of when I think of shared purpose is um, Jimmy Carter, ex-president Jimmy Carter and his wife and Habitat for Humanity and how they have this shared purpose of service. So just something to think about when you're looking for what are the traits and qualities and values I'm seeking in a partner. And with a shared and with, a shared, and with a shared vision for the future, you both agree on the basic things. Kids or no kids? Will you both work 
or will one of you stay at home with the kids? Or is everybody working from home and we're living together 24 seven under one roof or some other possibilities? I know couples that are in a committed monogamous relationship, but they don't live together. You also want to look and see what are some similar shared interests and activities. And while you certainly don't have to share all the activities, are you willing to be accepting of the things they love, but you don't? And given the era that we're in now, where politics is everywhere and there's so many divisive things going on, you need to know well in advance as you're dating somebody what where they stand on everything from politics. You need to know where they stand on everything from politics to religion to mass and vaccines. Now, when I was first studying, you know, or becoming a student of love, I came across this great quote from Joseph Campbell, very famous mythologist, and what he had to say about marriage. And what he said was, marriage is not a love affair. A love affair is a totally different thing. A marriage is a commitment to that which you are. That person is literally your other half and you and the other are one. That is what he says. He says a marriage is a life commitment and a life commitment means it's the prime concern of your life. If marriage is not the prime concern, you are not married. A little bit heavy, but I believe it's true. It's also been said that incompatibility is the challenge of marriage. And I'm not sharing you, and I'm not sharing this with you to depress you, but because we need to first accept that it's okay and normal for breakdowns and conflicts to occur in our relationships. And in fact, earlier I met, I meant. And in fact, earlier I mentioned Dr. John Gottman, the researcher, and his institute has shown that every happily married couple, not just some, every happily married couple has a minimum of nine irreconcilable differences. So these are things you're never going to agree on. And they are things that you have to accept to agree to disagree on. And the number one item, the number one thing that leads to divorce, you could probably guess, is money. Because in almost every couple, you have a spender and a saver. And it takes really good, clear communication and cooperation to navigate this one. So personally, in my marriage, I'm the saver. And at times, my husband even calls me his frugal wife. And in our early days together, we found a creative solution. This is how we solved the difference. We ended up having three piles of money, mine, his, and ours. And we didn't police each other over the individual accounts, but we did have an agreement. No one spending large sums, no one spending large sums of money from the our money pile without first talking it over. And this works really well for us. And then there are no surprises. And, you know, I get to be me, he gets to be him, and we worked it out. Another really big irreconcilable difference is often sex. One person wants it twice a day, the other once, once a month. Or one person's a clean freak, the other's a messy slob. And by the way, I'm the messy one in our relationship. And then you have the on-time person and the always late person. So I need you to know that all of these kinds of differences are normal and they're not a reason to divorce, but they do represent a challenge to find creative solutions. So I hope it's helpful for you to understand that when stuff comes up, it doesn't mean you're incompatible. It just means you guys have to put on your thinking caps and find a creative solution. Now, here's some really good news. For those couples who are willing to invest the time and energy into their relationship, they're going to lead longer, healthier lives. And in fact, the current research is now showing that married couples in a good marriage are likely to live longer, 
If they do get sick, they're going to experience less pain and heal faster, and they're going to be happier. And why is this? Because married people tend to take better care of themselves, and they avoid risky behavior. And here's the most fascinating thing I found out. One of the studies found that married men live seven years longer than single or divorced men, okay? So guys, you may be thinking, I don't ever want to get married again. Well, how committed are you to your longevity? Find a good woman. You'll live longer. Now, now, so what does it take to have a good marriage? Even if your mate is the most perfect person in the world for you, there are going to be days when you're going to want to strangle them. You know, days when you're beyond irritated and it looks like they are the problem. And Dr. Hendricks says, and the first time he told me this, I just about cried. This is what he said. He says, you know, you're in the right relationship when it starts off as a dream come true and then rapidly devolves into your worst nightmare. Sounds dreadful, right? But here's what he means. So Dr. Hendricks and his wife and partner, Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt, they believe that on an unconscious level, we have a built-in mate selector. This is like a filter that's built in from our childhood that determines who we're going to choose for a lifetime partner. And that this selector is designed so that it recreates some of the interactions with our parents. It's actually designed to filter in somebody who's going to trigger us with some of our most painful childhood emotional experiences. Now, this sounds terrible, right? But there's a purpose to it because they believe the true purpose of marriage, of taking sacred vows, is to kick up all of our childhood wounds and to be able to heal them in the sacred container of marriage. So what generally happens is you meet someone, you fall in love, it appears that you're in sync on almost everything, that honeymoon phase, life is grand, and then suddenly one day reality sets in and they say something and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I'm feeling just like I did when I was around my father or the way you're looking at me reminds me of my mother. And there you have it. Our old core wounds are getting kicked up. And this illusion, this breaking of this illusion of perfect compatibility is really what Dr. Hendricks was talking about. So just like the being in love phase has specific brain chemistry, this phase also has a change in brain chemistry and our levels of dopamine fall while our levels of cortisol rise. And we go from excitement to frustration, to fear, conflict, and opposition. So it does happen. It happens to everybody. And it's another one of these things to consider normal, not like, oh, I don't think I love him anymore. I don't think I love her anymore. That's not what's happening. You're going through this normal cycle. And Brian and I found this out in our own relationship um, because my built-in mate selector ended up bringing in somebody who was a youngest child. And youngest children have this deep need to be listened to and heard. And I am the world's worst listener. I'm an oldest child. So I'm always in my own head thinking about stuff. And I have a really bad tendency to drift when someone else is speaking. And then on top of being a bad listener, I also have a bad memory. So it's perfect. We're together. We're both healing pieces of our childhood wounds. And even though Brian still says to me at times, you're not listening to me. Sometimes he'll stop and say, Oh, right. That's my issue, not yours. So you can have some humor and have some fun with it. So um, one of the other things I learned from Dr. Hendricks, who you can tell I worship and adore, is that you can tell that I worship and adore him, is that I grew up hearing and believing that in order to make a marriage work, you always had to compromise. And somehow in my mind, to me, compromise was lose, lose. I'll lose some, you'll lose some, and then we'll 
both be just a little bit happy. But thanks to Dr. Hendricks, I've since learned a great way to reframe this in a much more positive way. And he explained to me one day that A, creative tension is good for a relationship and that there are win-win ways to solve seemingly impossible differences. And I asked him to give me an example. And he told me this great story. He said, his idea of a perfect day is to get beyond his idea of a perfect day is to get behind the wheel of a car and then drive all day long. And his wife, Helen's idea of the perfect day is to sit in her living room doing needlepoint or crochet. And if she has to leave the house, she wants to know where is she going and for how long and when can she be back? And then one day they bought an RV. Now Harville gets to drive to his heart's content and Helen is always at home in her RV living room. So how brilliant is that? So the big question becomes, how do we prepare for our inevitable differences? And after I wrote my book, The Soulmate Secret, some of my married friends started to ask me, well, Arielle, how do I turn my mate into my soulmate? And I really started to ponder that. And I decided to see if I could reverse engineer my own relationship because I had figured out some ways to make it work for me and Brian, and maybe these ways could work for other people. And one of the first things I remembered was that early on in our relationship, we agreed that our number one priority would be to make choices and decisions based on not what did I want or what did Brian want, but what was best for the relationship really making the priority to choose what is best for the relationship. And that actually made things really easy. And then I remembered that I incorporated something I had learned 20 years ago called Wabi Sabi, not wasabi, you eat that with sushi, but Wabi Sabi. And Wabi Sabi is an ancient Japanese aesthetic that honors all things old, worn, weathered, imperfect, and impermanent. And it does this by finding the beauty in the imperfections. So for example, you know, imagine that I had this big Ming vase here, just use your imagination. And there's this big crack down the middle of it. A Japanese art museum would put this broken vase on a pedestal and then they would shine a spotlight on the crack, or they might even fill the crack with 24 karat gold. So Wabi Sabi Love, is devoted to exploring the simple, fun, and effective ways to find the beauty and perfection in each other's imperfections. And I call this going from annoyed to enjoyed because modern day society has set us up and conditioned us to seek perfection everywhere. And we all know that perfection doesn't exist, but looking for perfection, desiring perfection, keeps us in a state of frustration and dissatis keeps us in a state of frustration and dissatisfaction and in truth we don't have to be that way because i have now renamed the word perfection and i call it pure fiction it's just an impossible goal but if you decide to incorporate wabi-sabi love you can come to appreciate your imperfections and those of your partner. And I'm sure you don't have to think too hard to think about what their imperfections are. So um, I'm going to tell you one of the first ways Brian and I figured out how to wabi-sabi our relationship. Um, one day, or early in our marriage, I found myself like this. I had my hand here. I was ragging on him. I don't even remember about what, but I caught myself doing it. And I was really appalled at my behavior. And I said to him, the next time I get like this, and unfortunately there will be a next time, you have my permission to kindly, gently say to me, when did Sheila enter the room? Now, Sheila is my gorgeous, brilliant, amazing mother, but she can sometimes be a bit bossy and overbearing. And much to my surprise, Brian said, okay, and when I get too paternalistic, you can call me Wayne, the name of his much beloved father. So in this instant, we found a wabi-sabi way to diffuse 
what could have spiraled into World War III. Because in this moment, I noticed my overbearingness. I noticed my bossiness. And I was able to have empathy for what it was like for Brian. And he quickly, quickly did the same thing for me. So we found this really fun and easy way to be together with what we call our code names. And to this day, we still use them. Sheila and Wayne still pop up whenever one of us is getting pushy or difficult. So Wabi Sabi Love is about making a shift in perception. It's about, tape, it's about taking something you're judging as bad or wrong or upsetting and then finding a way to find the beauty and perfection of it. I mean, it's really, it's amazing stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to share with you my absolute favorite Wabi Sabi love story. And it's about my friends, Jerry and Diane. And for 30 years, actually more than that now, they've been together teaching about love all over the world, the power of love to heal and how to give and receive unconditional love. And of course, romantic love. But when Jerry and Diane got married, he was already 20 years her senior and um, he came with an addiction that she didn't know about. <laughs> Jerry is addicted to poppy seed bagels. And every morning he would get up before Diane and he'd go into the kitchen and he would slice a poppy seed bagel. And that, of course, would send lots of little black seeds all over Diane's white tile floor. And then he would toast his bagel and he'd put a smear of cream cheese on it. And then he'd walk around the kitchen eating his bagel, dropping even more seeds. Now, Diane would come into the kitchen much later, and every morning she had the same routine. She would wet a paper towel, she would get on her hands and knees, and she'd begin cleaning up the seeds. And as you can probably figure out, you can't sweep the seeds, right? The broom comes, the seeds scatter. So this was her pattern every day on her hands and knees, wiping up these little black poppy seeds. And one day when she was in a particularly grumpy mood, as she was wiping up the seeds, she had this thought, what has to happen so I never do this again? And as if hit by lightning, Diane suddenly realized, oh, oh, that would mean there'd be no more Jerry. And she started to cry and she gazed down at the, at the seeds and she suddenly had this amazing epiphany that the seeds now meant she had another day to spend with Jerry, right? So did Jerry change? Did she say, oh, Jerry, you've got to just slice your bagel over the sink. No, none of that happened. She had a shift in perception. And that's what Wabi Sabi love is. It's about learning to accept the flaws, the imperfections, the limitations, and love them anyway. Okay, it's a form of sacred love. And I'll tell you one last Wabi Sabi love story that will, will also give you a good idea of what it is. So I was teaching this course in Idaho several years ago, and this woman stood up and she told me that there was no Wabi Sabi she told me there was no Wabi Sabi love solution for her and her husband. And I said, okay, well, try me, just tell me. And she said, she said, well, I've been married to Garth for 16 years and I'm a perfectionist. I'm a clean freak. I'm a neat neck and he's a total messy slob. And the only reason we're still together really right now is because he has an out of town job and he's gone two weeks of every month. And then, you know, the house is mine when he's gone, it's pristine. And then he comes back and then it gets all messy again. And, and I just don't know if I can live like this anymore. So I thought about it for a moment. I, I asked her, I said, well, Stephanie, do you have a dog? And she said, yes. And I said, does your dog shed? She said, yes. I said, what do you do when your dog sheds? She said, I vacuum up after him. I said, well, do you love your dog? And she got really quiet and then she started to laugh and she said, Oh my God, Garth sheds, Garth sheds. And she saw that just like her dog can't help shedding, Garth can't help being a slob. It's just who he is. 
Now, a year later, I had to call her because I wanted to find out, was that just a workshop aha moment or did something change? And what she told me was that their marriage had never been better. In fact, he had quit his job to create a home-based business so they could be together 24 seven. And yes, he's still the messy one. So Wabi Sabi Love isn't about changing someone. It's about learning to love the beauty and perfection of their imperfections. It's kind of like, here, let me, let me show you. I'll demonstrate something for you here. So there was a, a study done at the University of Buffalo by Dr. Sandra Murray a few years ago. And what she discovered was that couples who choose to wear rose colored glasses, who choose to idealize their partner actually have happier, more satisfying relationships. Now, why is this? It's because they're always looking for what's right instead of looking for what's wrong. Something we could probably do with all our relationships, right? Now, there is one caveat about Wabi Sabi love. There are some places where it totally doesn't work. So it doesn't work for bad behavior or any kind of abuse or any kind of active ad addiction. Okay. So if you have bad behavior, abuse, or, so if you have bad behavior, abuse, or addiction, do not try to wabi sabi love your way out of it. Go and find a professional. Okay. But for everything else from all the other minor irritations, just get creative and find ways to find beauty and perfection in the imperfections. Now, another really good thing to understand when you're in a relationship is that we have to look at forgiving, okay? We need to be forgiven, they need to be forgiven. And why do we need to forgive? Because we have to give up our the hurt and the suffering, right? We have to let go of finding value in anger or blame or let go of the desire to judge somebody else. Okay, so it's a choice to forgive. It's a choice to feel love rather than judge or condemn. And I know it's not easy. Okay, but we need to do it for us. Okay, so that we're not carrying the negativity. Forgiveness releases us from the past. It allows us to heal. It allows us to let go and to be more at peace. Okay. And when I find myself in this situation, often the first person I need to forgive is me. I'm always my harshest. I'm always my harshest judge. And when I've done something wrong and it's almost something I never meant to do, I just beat myself up. So self forgiveness is really important. And then, once I get to forgiveness, sometimes I need to apologize. Okay. So, you know, just saying you're sorry isn't always enough. And my friend who's a psychologist, Dr. Sherry Myers has come up with this great formula on how to do a proper apology. She actually calls it the four R's. So the first one is to recognize and acknowledge the pain you've caused. Then express your regret and your remorse about what you've done and the pain it's caused. And then take responsibility for your actions. Share your desire to reconcile or remedy so that you can give your friend what they need to feel safe and whole again with you. Okay, so the three R's, right? We're going to recognize and acknowledge the pain, express regret, take responsibility and remedy. All right. That's how we do a good apology. Now, we're also living in this crazy time of cancel culture, you know, and the thing that I really am dismayed about with cancel culture is that people aren't getting second chances. All right. Nobody's waking up in the morning thinking, you know, what could I do today to get canceled? How could I ruin somebody's life? How could I say something stupid publicly? We've all said and done stupid, regrettable things. And I believe that if we own what we've done and we've given a proper apology and we make amends, 
we should be forgiven. Okay, this is an issue in both our personal relationships and in our culture. Okay, so your significant other may not be the greatest person on the planet. And it, you know, they are going to make you crazy from time to time. So when your annoyance button has been fully pressed, take a time out, go calm yourself down, get yourself to neutral, close your eyes, take some deep breaths. I think by now we've all learned how to do mindful breathing, right? We want to breathe in slowly to the count of four, hold for the count of four, breathe out slowly for the count of four and do that 10 times. And then before you go and think you're going to have a confrontation with them, imagine this. I watch a lot of Law & Order on TV when I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm a Law & Order junkie, so this is where this analogy comes from. Imagine you're both in a courtroom. You're in front of the judge and the jury, and you're the defense attorney for your partner. It's your job to argue on their behalf and explain to the judge and jury why they're behaving the way they are and what caused them to do it. And I want you to argue like their life depends on it. And if you do this, chances are you're going to dissipate your annoyance and reach a deeper level of understanding of their behavior. And then I also want us to all agree on something. Don't you think there should be a, don't you think there should be a statute of limitations on how long we're going to hold on to minor offenses? I mean, really. If you're going to forgive them, or if you need to be forgiven, then let's just move on. Okay, let's stop holding on to grudges. Okay, and do what I like to call, let's, let's have love amnesty. Okay, let's have love amnesty for ourselves, our friends, our family, and our fellow imperfect humans. Because life's hard enough these days without judging people for relatively minor effects. Life's hard enough these days without holding grudges and judging people for relatively minor offenses. And I will confess one thing to you. Sometimes I get perverse pleasure in being angry and self-righteous, especially when I'm offended by someone's behavior. But the truth is the only one getting hurt is me and my nervous system. So when I get into this state, this perverse pleasure, I do a crazy thing. I do my mindful breathing. And then I channel my inner Dalai Lama. I see the Dalai Lama in my heart laughing and exuding love and compassion. And then I consciously choose to embrace his frequency of love. How's that? Okay. So let's talk about honesty and transparency. It's likely you've seen relationship experts Gay and Katie Hendricks on Oprah. Helicopter. Yes, I will. I don't know if you can hear the, the planes and helicopters. So that's, can you hear them? Yeah, okay. That's why I stopped. Okay, so let's talk about honesty and transparency. You've likely seen relationship experts Gay and Katie Hendricks on Oprah. They are the masters at couples communication. And one day I asked them, how do you share something with your partner that you're really afraid to talk about? Maybe even something you've been withholding for a really long time. And they actually had a great answer. They said, you start by saying something like, there's something that I haven't shared with you and I'm feeling really scared. And I realize I'm feeling scared because I've been withholding it for a long time. And I'd really like to finally share this with you, but I'm, a, I'm really kind of afraid that when you hear what I have to say, you might not love me anymore. That's how you start. And then you get curious with each other and you ask questions. And if they say, tell me more or what happened next, just keep the conversation going because there's so much power in truth telling and vulnerability 
And when you do need to have a deeper conversation, there are some guidelines to set up the talk so that it really will work out as a win-win. So the first thing you want to do is ask your partner when they're going to have time to discuss a problem you are having. You just say to them, hey, I really need your advice on something. I'm having a problem. When's a convenient time for us to talk? I really want to get your point of view, all right? And then when they say, okay, well, let's go for a walk at four o'clock, whatever. Get yourself into a really nice neutral heart space before you meet with them. And you can start the conversation with, I know how much you love me and I really need to share blank or I really need your help with blank. And do this in a spirit of loving cooperation. Do this from a place of not blame or shame or you did this wrong, but I know how much you love me and I really need your help with blank. And whatever it is they did, you know, just know that they probably never did it on purpose. Your partner wants to love you and they want to be loved for who they are in spite of their shortcomings. So in this conversation, make an effort to let them know they are loved, even if some of their behavior was not, okay? So wabi-sabi love can be so helpful, right? And it just takes a little practice. You know, it's about becoming a better listener, being willing to forgive, finding a shared purpose in the world, um, changing your point of view, having a shift in perception, and really embracing the fact that we're all just so imperfect. Now, before we leave this topic, I want to give you one of the best pieces of relationship advice I ever heard. And it came from my friend, Jack Canfield. And he said that once a week, he asks his wife this question. He says, what can I do to make your life better? Isn't that like the most loving, caring question ever? What can I do to make your life better? Remember that one. So the last thing I want to say about Wabi Sabi Love is this. It really only takes one person to make a difference. I mean, even if your partner isn't willing to change, it doesn't mean all is lost. Because when you take personal responsibility for your own happiness and you make space for your partner to be who and what they are, magic will happen. And, you know, conversely, if you're into blaming and shaming, you already know that's not going to work. So just start to open your heart, start to embrace finding the beauty and perfection and imperfection, and it's going to make all the difference in the world. All right. So that's some of the best stuff I know about how to have a good marriage. But for you singles out there, I promise to tell you, how to find your soulmate life partner online. So let's move into that, okay? So I know that most of you would love to have love happen organically. You know, the meet cute like it does in the movies. You, you trip, a handsome man catches you, you fall instantly in love. You know, one of those things. Unfortunately, that probably only happens to 2% of the population. For the rest of us mere mortals, especially our smart, successful, attractive mere mortals, manifesting a soulmate requires a winning game plan. And just like when you pursue a new job or you want to expand your business, you need to create opportunities for success. And the best way to do it these days is to embrace online dating. And even if you've tried it in the past and you're firmly entrenched in, I tried it, it didn't work. I'm going to ask you to open your mind and open your heart and really see, are, am I serious about finding a soulmate? Because if you are, there's gazillions of people out there online and you have to be visible. Okay. So I'm going to start by telling you all the great reasons to date online. Okay. During the pandemic, what did we become experts at? Come on, you know, shopping online, okay? We know how to enter our search requirements. We know how to sort through all the offerings. You know, we can do this whether we're looking for the perfect yoga pants or a new flashlight. So we're going to go shopping 
for a mate online. And online dating is super easy. It's low cost. You can do it in your PJs anytime, day or night, from your home, on your phone. And although the apps, the one thing they don't do for you, like Amazon might, is you don't get five-star ratings, okay? You have to go in, make the connections, and then check them out by talking and meeting. This is the whole purpose of dating, okay? So you can give them a rating. You can decide, is this the one for me? So if you're looking for love online, there's no shortage of apps. Now, from my experience and the people that I coach in relationships, I have seen the best results from both Match.com and Bumble sort of a close second. But there's so many other legitimate sites. And there's lots of ones that are more specific. Like, say, for instance, you're religious. There's Christian Mingle. Or if you're Jewish, there's J-Date. If you're over 50, there's Our Time. Um, if you're a vegetarian, there's VeggieDate.com. If you're into, you know, if high education is really important to you, there's Elite Singles for Educated Mature Adults. And here's the best news. Right now, today, one in three marriages begins online. Okay, one in three. So in online dating, you get to be upfront and honest in your profile about your desires and your standards. And then you get to eliminate all the people who aren't fit, right? Um, you're going to need great photos and good profile copy. And I'm going to tell you in a minute how to do that. Um, you can speed up the whole dating and mating timeline. You don't have to passively sit and wait to meet somebody. You can meet somebody right now, today. And how many people are there to meet? There are over 110 million single adults in the U.S. right now. Okay? That's like 43% of the population is single. All right? And one of the things I also want you to remember is that there are 7.5 billion people alive on the planet right now. Half of them are single. There's no shortage of people to meet, okay? But first you gotta cultivate a winning mindset, okay? You need a winning mindset for finding love online. And here's the first thing I would ask you to do. Start with what the Buddhists call beginner's mind. Begin by taking your opinions, your reasons, your beliefs about why you can't or why you haven't found love or why online dating hasn't worked for you and put them on a shelf for now, okay? Just allow yourself to not know how or when or where your soulmate will appear. Just for today, just for now, surrender and trust that everything is about to work out in your favor. I mean, just... Use your imagination and be a total optimist. This is going to work, okay? There's no shortage of love in the world, okay? Just like we have, at least in our part of the world, you, there's no shortage of fresh air. There's no shortage of clean water. There's no shortage of love. So it's your job to be open, willing, available, and visible so that you and your soulmate can find each other. And that means you're going to take the time and the energy and actively use the magic of the dating apps, okay? And then open yourself to meeting new people. The next thing you need for your mindset is to manage your expectations. Because here's the reality about online dating. And you're not going to like this part, but I'm going to give it to you straight, all right? 90% of the people you see and meet online are not going to be even close to what you want, okay? And it's true. There's all kinds of scammers out there and phonies and people who are going to ghost you. That's also true. You need, to do, you need to use your discernment and you need to remember that you are in control. You're in control about who you connect with and how. So whatever happens, don't take any of it personally and don't let it stop you for, you know, and don't let it stop you from succeeding. If you reach out to someone and they don't respond, remember, they don't even know you. Just move on because you're only looking for one. All right. And the process along the way is going to be disappointing at times. And it's it's going to require and it's going to require you to wade through a murky, disappointing pool of, well, I won't say any ugly words, but you know what I mean. Okay. 
And here's why you're doing it. Okay. Here's why you're taking the time and energy to find the one, because when you two get together, it's going to be so worth it. Okay. You're going to forget about all the people who showed up in your search that were like, oh my God, no way, never. Or all the first dates you had, they were like, oh my God, no, never. Because you only need one. All right. Now, one other parts to this, I want you to be open-minded when you're connecting with somebody. Okay. I want you to think about, let's say you did a video date with somebody and they didn't knock your socks off, you know, on a scale of one to 10, they were 6.5 see them again. Okay. If you had a good enough time, see them again. Okay. Some people are shy. Some people don't fully show up as their best selves initially. So if they didn't totally gross you out a line that my friend dating expert, Carol Allen always says, if they didn't totally gross you out, give them a second chance. And here's one other thing to remember. If you're feeling those instant fireworks, that also doesn't mean that they're the one, okay? Those fireworks are often short-lived and they're absolutely no indication that this person has the capacity to be a lifetime partner. All right, so one of the first things you're gonna need to be effectively dating online is a profile, okay? And these days the experts are agreeing it should be around 200 words, 250 words. So that's maybe three paragraphs. And I actually believe that you should put your romantic goal at the very top of the profile. So if you want marriage and kids, say so. If you want a long-term monogamous partner, say so. If you're a practicing kid, if you are a practicing Christian who loves country music, say so. If you're someone who must have a lover of whitewater river rafting, say so, okay? So I'm gonna tell you in a second, uh, how to write the profile, but I want you to also keep in mind that when you're doing this, do your best to be typo free and grammatically correct. But at the same time, when you see that other people have made typos and grammar mistakes in their profiles, don't cut them off. Don't be judgy. Just realize that they're human like all of us and they make mistakes. So the thing to know about writing a profile and the biggest mistake most people make is they put in these lists. I love to hike, bike, dance, walk on the beach, see movies and cook. Boring, 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 boring. So when you write a profile, you want to do what we writers call show, not tell. All right. So I'm going to tell you the profile that I wrote for myself. If I were single and if I needed to go onto a dating app, my headline would say, happily living like Dolce Vita. I'm a content optimist ready for a marriage-minded soulmate playmate. I'm as happy in the backyard listening to the birds sing and watching sunsets as much as I love romantic strolls through Balboa, as much as I love romantic strolls through Balboa Park and exploring the back streets and foods of Italy. I much prefer experiences over stuff, Rachel over Hannity, Seinfeld over Carrot Top, and Stevie Wonder over Kanye. I use my creativity inventing awesome celebrations and cooking tasty, healthy meals infused with love. My risotto infused with Prosecco is legendary. And if I were a basketball player, the MBAs would want my excellent team player abilities and I'll cheer you on in your life with enthusiasm and passion. My guiding philosophy is to find beauty and perfection in imperfection, both mine and yours. And I consider myself a pleasure puppy. I do at least one thing every day that is super pleasurable. It's a highly teachable skill and I'm happy to share. So that would be my profile, right? There were no lists of things. I was able to paint a there were no lists of things. I was able to paint a picture. You could get a pretty good idea of things I like to do and what I'm looking for and why you might even want to be with me. You know, if you if you're somebody who who um, loves team sports, you could see that I'm 
open to that. I'm willing to talk about it. if you're somebody who likes to eat, you could tell that I'm a foodie. You can also probably tell where I stand politically, which I believe must be in your profile these days. It will save so much time. I had one client who didn't put this in her prof profile. She had three dates with a man that she was very attracted to, liked very much. They had a lot of similar interests, but when it came to politics, no way. I mean, they both agreed there, there was just too much of a big difference and they'd both wasted a lot of time when it could have been very clearly stated in the profile. Now, once you get your profile done, you must have great photographs. Okay. We humans are visual creatures and to succeed online, you need to have three to six good, clear, well-composed photos. Okay. These are photos that are showing you living your life casual things that you do, things that you enjoy, things you'll get dressed up for. So you want, you know, maybe something like a picture of you in nature, if you like hiking or a picture of you playing tennis or a picture of you doing something sporty, you're gonna need at least one full length shot. Uh, and if you can afford it at all, get a professional, okay? Really, maybe one selfie in there, but not a lot of selfies. Because when you have a great profile coupled with compelling photos, you're going to be more visible to your soulmate faster. Okay, so this means you're going to put in time and energy and resources to present your best self. Now, I know you know how to do this when you're putting your resume together, right? You put your best self together. So you want to do this with your photos. And there's a couple of no-nos for photos. So no kids, no friends. And if you have a pet, one pet photo is the max. And the thing with kids is if you're a single parent, all right, and you are definitely seeking somebody who's a kid lover, then maybe one picture with your kid or kids. I had one client who had five boys, five boys. She was in her early 40s. She went online. She posted the photo of her and her five boys. A couple weeks ago, she sent me a picture of her wedding <laughs> with her and her new husband who'd never had kids, who couldn't wait to be a stepdad to five kids. So you decide for yourself what works best. Then when it comes to women and these photos, ladies, I have a couple of tips specifically for you. You want to wear colors that you look good in. And Generally, as a rule, people would say don't wear black, white, or beige because the research is showing that men really enjoy color. So figure out what colors you look best in, colors you feel good in, and then think about the necklines that most flatter you. And ideally, you won't be wearing hats unless they're pertinent to your hobby or sport and no sunglasses, okay? And no real sexy super shots because those basically say I'm only looking for a hookup. Now, once you have your photos, get a trusted friend, somebody who really loves you that has good taste and let them help you decide which photos show off your energy and your personality because most of us really can't see ourselves that well. Now, ladies, 90% of your success initially online is going to come from your photos, okay? And this doesn't mean you have to be drop dead gorgeous. Most of us are not, but it does mean you have to have current recent photos that really show you and your personality. We wanna see the best version of you, happy, smiling, approachable. And it doesn't matter what your age or your size or your hair color is. We just wanna feel you and see you. And the thing that we're going to talk about now is age. Okay. Women often ask me, can I lie about my age online? You know, because so many of us feel that we look younger than our real true age. I mean, I'll fess up. Do you want to know how old I am? I'm going to be 69 in a couple of weeks. All right. So, but I don't mind. I tell everybody that. So when it comes to age, there is no right or wrong answer on this. But here's what I can tell you. If you decide to take some years off online, in your profile, there's a final statement I would add, okay? So you could read something like this. Just a heads up, I want to let you know 
to make sure I don't miss out on a great match because of algorithm. Just a heads up. I want to let you know to make sure I don't miss out on a great match because of algorithm match. Fuck. Just a heads up. What? Okay. Okay. Should I mention my age or not since I'm going to do this over? Okay. Now, for those of you of a certain age who are wondering, should I lie about my age online? You know, many people do this because they look younger than their true age. I mean, I'm happy to tell you my age. I'm going to be 69 in a couple of weeks. But some people actually feel much younger and really want to um, take a few years off. So it's okay to do this if that's what you want to do. But here's something I would say at the end of your profile. I would say just a head, just a heads up. I shaved a few years off of my age because of the algorithm based matching. I didn't want to miss out on a great match like you. And this isn't a bait and switch. It's just a general, genuine desire to show up for the right person. Okay. So you want to confess and explain why you did it. And people will understand. We all understand what the algorithms do these days, okay? So that's the age thing. You decide for yourself. Now, let's talk a little bit about safety online. The first thing you want to do is go to Google Voice. When you go to Google Voice, you can get a phone number for free that's attached to your cell phone. So nobody's going to have your real cell phone number. The next thing you want to do is create a new email address that does not have your first or last name in it. Okay, you need to have an email that's really safe. Maybe it'll have your nickname. Like uh, if I were going to be online, my nickname would be Sunny Rose at yahoo.com or something like that. Because you don't want an email someone can find and they're sending you all kinds of crazy messages in the middle of the night. Then, should, should I Google somebody I'm going to meet in the real world? The answer is yes, you could if you want to, but only spend a couple of minutes reading the first page. Don't do a deep dive. Don't make all kinds of assumptions, uh, just enough to make you feel comfortable. And then if you are going on a date in the real world, tell a friend where you're going. All right, let somebody know, oh, I'm going to the Starbucks at 5th and Main at 3 o'clock. I'll call you by 4. All right, let somebody know where you are. The other thing to know is that when you're posting photos on an online dating site, it's essential that you don't use any photos that currently exist online. Now, why is this? Because really talented people can search photos and find you online. Then they're going to find all your social media and they're going to find your real name and you're going to lose your anonymity. So this is the reason you need to get all new photos that are only for the purpose of online dating. All right. And then as you are looking at people's profiles, you want to focus on people who appear to be positive, confident, and happy. All right. And if you end up dating somebody a few times that you meet online and you're very interested in them and you tend to run a little paranoid, there are excellent uh, background check companies that you can find online for a small amount of money. You can do a complete back background check. But I would, again, urge you to not take everything seriously. Like I, I looked up somebody for someone else once and I saw that 20 years ago, they had had a bankruptcy, but I know who they are today, right? It doesn't mean that because somebody once had a bankruptcy 20 years ago, they're a bad person. Because really, when you're looking for your ideal mate, one of the most important qualities you want to be looking for is, is this person financially responsible? You know, you may be saying, you know, a lot of women say, well, I want to marry a man who earns more money than me. And I always say to them, not necessarily. You know, you want somebody who's financially responsible, you know, and can share the lifestyle that you like. 
but just looking at dollar signs isn't the most important thing. We've all heard stories of, you know, women who married very wealthy men. And in fact, one of the housewife shows is all about this right now, and then they lose all the money. So financial responsibility, absolute, very important value to be looking for. Now, in terms of how to prepare yourself to start dating online, uh, I have another dating expert friend, Dr. Lara Fernandez, who says, create a sacred ritual for yourself before you go online. So what you want to do is plan to set aside 30 minutes a day to go in and search and respond to emails and all of that. But do it with a ritual. Do it with a sense of commitment and purpose. And, you know, maybe you want to brew your favorite cup of tea and light a candle and say a prayer and, you know, meditate or do mindfulness for a few minutes and settle into your body and really get yourself ready and think of this, think of this time as a sacred ritual. Like put a big smile on your face and anticipate having fun and, and reading the responses and the profiles and making dates and all of that. Like have fun with this. All right. Now, another great tip is get out your calendar today and start blocking out time when you're going to start having video dates and in the real world dates. Why do you do this? Because all of us are super busy. Block the time now. Decide now. These are the days and times that I'm available to be making dates. You know, don't wait to put it on your calendar just when somebody says, oh, when can we get together? Know that in advance. Um, another thing that I discovered was there was a survey done of married men who met their, their wives online and they asked them, what kinds of photos of women online really drew you to your wife? And all of them said that they were most drawn to pictures that were like the girl next door kind of vibe, a woman that they would feel really good introducing to their mother. So also keep that in mind when you're doing your pictures. So, So one other thing I want to tell you that I discovered was that they're now finding that the women who reach out to men online are having the greatest success. So I'm going to urge you, don't be passive. You know, don't wait for someone to come find you. Start reaching out and connecting. All right. And here's a fun way to do it. You know, send, let's say like this happened, this happened to one of my clients. She was online, she saw a profile of this man and she saw a picture of him and she could tell by the picture that he was at a University of Texas football game, her alma mater, and he was holding a camera with a giant telephoto sports lens. And all she wrote to him was, I also went to UT, I'm so envious of your telephoto lens. One sentence they are now married. Okay. That's how the dance begins. Just acknowledge something that they wrote or some photo that they had to start a conversation. You know, if they said, oh, I'm crazy about the Hawaiian pizza at Sammy's, you can send them a line. Hey, you and I must be pizza soulmates. I also love the Hawaiian pizza at Sammy's period hit send. Okay. It can be that easy. You know, or you can just ask them an open ended question. You know, it's like, I see that you uh, are crazy about antique cars. What's your dream car? All right. It's super, super easy. Now, one thing I'm going to really urge you not to do. Don't spend a lot of time texting. Okay. The purpose of texting in the beginning is to convey short messages. I'm running five minutes late, or what's the address again of that coffee shop? But don't engage in long, flirty texts. You can't get to know anything about them, really. All you're going to know is that they're, it's fun and it's witty and you're getting constant dopamine hits from the texting, but you're wasting your time. 
what you want to do once you decide that this is somebody you might want to connect with is get them on the phone or on a video chat as soon as possible. You want to be able to hear them, see them, feel them, talk to them. But please don't waste your life texting with strangers. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about setting up these, these short video dates. I would encourage you on the first one to have it have a hard stop at 15 or 20 minutes. Just, just tell them all, you know, up front, oh, you know, it looks like we'd have some fun getting to know each other. Why don't we FaceTime at 4 p.m. for 15 minutes? How does that sound? And then at the end of 15 minutes, if you're 100% certain, no way, no how, you're done with them, you can just easily say, wow, the time really flew by. I got to go. Great to meet you. You're gone, you know? Or if you had a good enough time, like a six or higher, and you're open to seeing them again, you can just say, wow, you're really interesting. You're really fun to talk to. I hope we can do it again, all right? But whatever you do, you don't want to spend this first call talking for hours. If it went well, best to leave them wanting more. So I'm going to, I'm going to help you out here on what I believe are currently some of the best questions to ask on an, an initial video date, okay? So the first one I would ask is, who were you with in quarantine? Now, why do I want to know this? Because we're going to find out, oh, well, I was with my ex-wife and my three kids helping homeschool them. Or I was here with my three roommates and my two dogs. Or I was all alone. You know, and of course, you're going to answer this question, too. And then I would ask him, well, what was the best part about quarantine for you? You know, just a fun question. And again, you'll answer that. And then you're going to ask the real money question, okay? The question that's going to clue you in as to whether or not they have any emotional intelligence. You're going to ask them, what was the hardest part of the pandemic for you? What was the hardest part of the pandemic for you? Okay, so those are the three openers that I would go, th go through with somebody that I would want to know. Then in the future, you can ask all kinds of fun questions like, who or what was the biggest influence on you when you were growing up? Where and how did you spend your summers? Uh, do you have any pets? Uh, what's the last movie you saw? Uh, what music's on your playlist? Are you working in your dream career? And if, and if they are, you know, what do you most love about it? Um, you know, you can ask them what lights you up about the work you do. And one of my favorite questions is, if you won the lottery tomorrow, how would it change your life? So you want to you want to have fun, you want to explore, and if they say anything that makes you at all uncomfortable or feels like a red flag, then you want to just be curious, you know, and, and ask them a follow-up question. Oh, it sounds like you just said ABC. Did I get that right? And a lot of times we make assumptions and we didn't hear it correctly. So uh, be kind, not judgy, and ask illuminating questions. Okay. So one other thing I think I want to talk to about is if you were with somebody on a date and you're a woman and they're a guy and you'd like to see them again, guys, I hope I'm not going to offend anybody. Sometimes they get a little insecure so you want to tell them at least three times how much fun you have. You want to really thank them. You want to sort of lay it on kind of thick so that they're really sure, you know, because you may have said it once and they didn't hear it, or you said it once and they didn't hear you, okay? Or conversely, if they're asking you for a second date and you're really sure you don't want to do it again, all you have to say is, you know, you're a really great guy or you're a really great gal, you're super interesting, but I just don't feel like there's a connection. But I am sure your soulmate's out there and I wish you really well and you're done, okay? So that's really all you, you need to know. Um, if you really want to see somebody and you don't hear back from them, my friend, another dating expert, as you can guess, all of my friends are dating experts, is a great woman named Bella Gandhi. And Bella says you have one opportunity if there's somebody you'd like to see again 
and they haven't gotten back to you. And it could be sending them a super short email. Hey, it was great meeting you last week. I think you're really interesting. I love that we talked about antique cars. I came across this article. I thought you'd be interested in it. Period. Hit send. Nothing more. If they don't get back to you, just move on. Okay. And don't take it personally. All right. They don't know you. They don't know you. It's not personal. So those are really like the best tips that I have on online dating. But what I want to remind you about is that you're in control. You're in control of all of it. You don't have to write back to everybody who writes to you. And if something feels bad, again, ask questions. Don't make assumptions. Um, if you show up in the real world for a date with somebody and they don't look, you haven't done the video chat, which I recommend you always do before leaving home, but you don't and you show up and they're 10 years older or 30 pounds heavier than what it says online. Just don't go in. Or if you do go in, don't sit down and you can just tell them, Hey, you know, you don't look anything like your online pictures. So I'm going to take off and just leave. All right. You don't have to feel obligated to spend time with somebody who has basically lied to you. Okay. So what do we want to do after this? We want to date. We want to really take our time to get to know somebody. We need to find out, do they have the capacity to be a good partner? You know, can you count on them to keep you physically and emotionally safe? Will they be there for you when you're stressed out or sick? You know, will they provide assistance? Um, when you share your thoughts and feelings, do they listen and respond with compassion and empathy and care? Do you trust them? Can you count on them to keep their word? And are they going to celebrate your wins in life? And are they going to hold your hand in the down times? And is there looking at yourself, you want to ask yourself, is their happiness as important to me as my own? And then here's the last possibly most important question. All right. Ask yourself, is this someone I want to be in quarantine with? Because what if it happens again? What if we go into lockdown again? Right? You know, is this someone I want to spend that much time with? So that's what I know about online dating. I can't say enough good things about it. You could just hold your nose, dive in, write a profile, get some good photos, give it a chance because whoever it is that's out there for you, they want to find you as much as you want to find them, but you have to become visible. You have to become visible. Now I want to leave you with the same thing I said earlier. There's no shortage of love in the world, but it requires that you put in a little time, energy, intention, and attention to your love life to make it happen. All right. You need to show up. You need to become visible. And then I'll leave you with my favorite all time quote from Sam Keen. We come to love not by finding a perfect person, but by learning to love an imperfect person perfectly. I wish you love. Okay, I'm done. Oh, good. How long was it? Oh my God, I need water. Yes. And you know, I ad libbed a lot of it. Um, okay. Well, you might want somebody to, you know, check it for typos and stuff. Okay. Um,